Greg Coffey. Our past shapes our present. It helps to identify who we are, where we're headed. What memories from your upbringing have sort of driven your decisions and aspirations? Wow, we're just going a new direction from Jawad. Um, I think um, when I was growing up, I, my aspiration was to own a house on Sydney Harbour. And um, I grew up in a bad suburb uh, in a great city. And I guess the name of my firm is the street of the house. I ended up buying a house in, on Sydney Harbour with my first uh, meaningful bonus. Um, I think we all need to be driven by a goal, I guess, at some point. When did you start believing in yourself? Like the big leap in confidence where you're like, I can do this. I don't know that anyone ever believes in themselves. Um, I think that that's the, the key to this business is understanding that um, the market's there to teach you how bad you are at your job. <laughs> and um, every time you get some kind of self-confidence that you're good at it, you tend to get taught very quickly that you're not as good as you think you are. Everyone marvels at your risk-taking appetite. But I've only ever heard you talk about your role as a risk manager. How do you differentiate? Uh, I think um, my risk appetite now is significantly different to that when I was younger. Um, I think um, if, I, if I break down my career, um, when, I, when you, know, you, you first start in your career and, and you're taught to um, manage your losses and let your profits run. But in reality, you're surrounded by risk managers that want to cut your positions as opposed to allow you to make significant capital through longer term trends, which, which basically means that you're forced into, a, a, I guess, a situation where you're continually trying to make sense to make a dollar as opposed to where I am now in my career, which is I'm, I'm, I'm trying to make sure I don't, uh, don't, don't lose such that I can make the dollar times times. But when, you know, when I was younger, my, my goal was to be uh, a, a money maker. Um, it was a wealth accumulation goal. Um, and then over my career, I've changed into, you know, into, I guess, a wealth manager now, and my focus is more on risk management than it is on making money. I mean, I tell all my LPs, when, you know, the question that you, know, you always get asked is, what, what's your return goal? And my return goal is, um, you know, or in my career, I would have come up with a number that was very high. And now I say my, my goal is to not lose money, to do sensible things, use the experience that I've built over my career, together with the experience we have at the firm, to build portfolios that are, that are sensible um, and bulletproof. And by bulletproof, I mean we are focused on not losing money. And if it means that we can't take the risk we want to take because it opens us up to left tail gap in performance, then we won't take that risk. It's a very different mindset to that of earlier in my career where it was be active in the marketplace, make every cent out of every market and any asset that's moving at any time of the day and be as big as possible um, to make as much money as possible and trade your way out of downside. It's, it's a very different philosophy now. When you do take a big swing now, what actually allows you to hold on to the position despite the volatility? I don't think we take big swings now, I guess, is the point. Mm -hmm. in, the, in, in, in the context of uh, historically my career, certainly we're... Um, We'll, we will take risk relative to the p and we've generated. Uh, we will take, you know, I think the, the, you know, the learning of my career is that you, you make all your money by taking three to four positions a year that work really well. And most of our risk is in fixed income, um, a little bit of currency, very little equity. And my job is to work out what rate cycles will look like and hold them for the whole cycle. You know, when I, when I was first 
Um, you know, in, I started my career in 94, and you know, everyone gets given reminiscence of a stock operator, everyone gets given market wizards. I mean, it probably still happens. I give all my people the same books when, when they started my firm. And, um, you know, I read a particular chapter about, and I think it was Paul Tudor Jones holding a fixed income position for three years, and I didn't really know how, when I first started trading in 94, how to hold a fixed income position for more than three minutes. I mean, you know, right, you have to stop out because it's going against you, and then you re reestablish. and I'm reading about this guy who's holding a trend for three years. I'm like, how do you how do, you do that? Um, and the first part of my career, the answer was, well, you can't because you don't have the rope from your management team. And the second bit is when you get the rope, um, you know, back, you know, in the early 2000s, it was, you know, you were able to really be ahead of the marketplace day trading because, you know, computers and algos weren't beating you. So we used to take very big positions for trends, hold the, hold the big position for the whole trend, but really be actively and aggressively managing the, the drawdown of that position via day trading. Um, and then all of a sudden, I got really, really bad at day trading. <laughs> and, and I thought, you know, it was just a phase and it actually just was the market changed. You know, I couldn't be the first guy trading after payrolls anymore because the algos had already traded every single piece of that number before I could pick the phone up. So I had to change. And that change really was, uh, was born in, in, into taking smaller positions, knowing you know, we caught a 1,100 basis point sell-off in Chilean rates, um, you know, two, two, two to three years ago, um, or three into one year ago. And uh, over a two-year cycle, we had 150 basis point pullbacks and weren't forced out of the position because I wasn't big enough. It's a sizing issue. Mm -hmm. And then you have to realize that, you know, you, you, if you can make money slowly and, and not be so big that your monthly P&L drawdown forces you out either through your own protocol or the all... LP protocol, or if you're working at a pod, your manager's protocol, then you're able to make the most money. Everyone in this room knows that drawdowns suck. How does your psychology change when you're in one? I think you naturally get, I, I, I think I try to pretend I'm in a drawdown phase when I'm not, so that we're not big enough to get the drawdown to have to act differently. Mm -hmm. uh, we're we're um, really, really, really hate losing money like everyone does, right? But I think the, I think the, um, the, key, the key part of running a macro hedge fund is not being stopped out, whether that's by your own psychology, whether that's by your, your investor's limits or your, or your manager's limit, it's to ensure that your size is never big enough to get you any, anywhere near what looks like a stop loss area. Um, which then gives you the ability, I guess, to get on the front foot when you're making money. And you have to, you know, look, when, when, you, when you see something and something changes or something, and you feel like you're in front of the curve or that the market suits your style or whatever it is, you, you need to make a lot of money out of that. So how do you decide when you want to become more aggressive? Like, what role does rational analysis versus intuition play in your decision making? I'm not sure. I think it's very, I, I think, I, I think you, when, when you've, you've been doing this for a long period of time, I guess it's, it's if you feel like it's a, a rational analysis, but it's probably more intuition that something's happening. Like, I, I, like, we were always taught, I mean, I think people get taught to layer into positions, you know, I, I like X, I'll buy a little bit of X, or sell a bit of X, whatever it is. It's going well, I'll buy a little bit more. I'll buy a little bit more as it's going up. Now, I think that's the most absurd way to manage money in the world, because what it means is that if you've caught a trend, your average in price is somewhere three quarters up. And then you get a 25% drawdown in the thing and you're back to flat. And then what do you do if you have another 5% drawdown? It makes no sense. So when we, when we have a, 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 a big idea and a big thought process, I like to think, okay, if my maximum size is 100 for this position, or I can lose X in that position, then I'll, do a two, I'll, I'll go in for 200 at the start. And then if I get the first part of the trade, I'll take off half, then I've got my full position, I'm in the money already. So it's, I try to do it backwards. I try to be big early, small late. You hate losing money, but then how do you manage or approach emotional self-discipline? Oh, I don't know. I don't understand the question. Like, how, this, how do you deal with like, just the, you know, protecting your mental and emotional state because of the volatility of the P&L? When you hit a losing streak, for example, I think, you, I, I think you understand. Like, I think I think you can. I mean, it's it's very important to know what your limits are and not get anywhere near them. 
right? If you, if you, if you think that you can lose X, you know, we'll call it whatever, 3% in, in, in a portfolio, and that's your limit, then make sure that your position size isn't going to lose you one and a half. You get nowhere near it, and you're always on the front foot. So you never find yourself feeling low in confidence? Or? Pretty much on a daily basis. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, I want, you to, I, want, I want you to finish a few sentences for me, all right? So my biggest strength as a trader is? Risk management. In moments of doubt, I remind myself that? Don't have an answer to that. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> when evaluating potential... Keep fighting, maybe. I don't keep know. fighting. Yeah. When evaluating potential trades, I always consider... Downside. In my approach to risk management, I always focus on... What's the same answer, downside? It's a risk management question. Sorry, I'm, I'm getting really boring. I'm sorry. <laughs> if I could give one piece of advice to a young trader, it would be... They're counting on you. <laughs> I think... Um, Trade smaller and let trends run longer is the thing that I do differently now that I wish I'd done earlier in my career. What keeps me going despite the ups and downs of trading is? It's a fun job. I don't know. It's I manage... Fear of, fear of failure. I don't know. I managed to get through a drawdown by... Fighting hard. Never giving up. When feeling overwhelmed or stressed, I find solace in? I'm really impressed with you remembering, remembering all this. <laughs> <laughs> you program yourself for all these questions. It's, 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 just to be clear, I, I have a thing on, on when I do these things, which is very, very rarely, which is I never want to know what the questions are, which I had said, like, we, we had a, a pre-prep interview. And I said to Joe, like, I don't know, I don't want to do this because I don't want to know what you're going to ask me. Now I'm, re I'm really regretting something. <laughs> <laughs> For the first time ever. Uh, sorry, last question. I'm trying to... I'm trying to when feeling overwhelmed or stressed, yeah. I find solace in... Family. I wouldn't be where I am today if it wasn't for... Well, there's so many answers to that question. Right? List. <laughs> Family. To the child who dreamed of making it big and buying a house on Sydney Harbour, I would say... That's too much of a cliché question, you know. And never give up, don't stop believing, you know. <laughs> it happened to me, it can happen to you, I don't know. <laughs> but it's you. The child who had that dream to make it big. Yeah, I got, we were to confront I got that. asked that question once. What would you tell your younger self? And I don't want to go anywhere near my younger self. Things are just fine. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, like, <laughs> I don't want to change anything in the time zone, timeline thing. No. Greg, to you, I say thank you. We've benefited greatly from the depth of experience and wisdom you've shared. Give it up for Greg Coffey. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome.